Oh, good morning. What is it? It's Friday, June 30th. So we did our crop tour yesterday and I was pretty excited actually. So we, we definitely were affected by drought or drought like conditions. Now, certainly not as bad as some areas across the province. Uh, we're kind of, kind of in the middle really, I guess. Um, so not much to complain about. We just came up here to, uh, to feed these critters. And uh, the other ones, there's, there's five more over on the other side of those trees. They haven't figured out that we're here yet. They normally come rushing right over. They're still a bit skittish. I want to check their uh, I want to check their molasses tank here. So we uh, we leave this tank out here and we leave it year round, free choice. It's got about that much left in it for us because we are not even we're not even producers. We're just kind of kind of people that have seven steers, so we don't really use that much. A two wheel tank like this is good for fifty head, and we have uh, well we have seven seven of these little guys on it so we don't have to fill it up very much I fill it up like once a year <laughs> but uh between the molasses and the uh and the grain that we've mixed up for them so this does have a supplement in it that's that little pellet certainly off the start when these guys are uh freshly weaned and they're not used to grain you want to have that pellet in there this is a mix of everything. It's mostly oats. And uh, then there's some peas in there, some sunflower seed, some barley, some wheat. Most likely there's a little bit of canola in there. <clears throat> so in no way am I a <clears throat> animal nutrition expert, but I really do believe more option is gonna be better. And that's the way, that's the way that, uh, that we feed our, our seven steers anyways. I, I realize that's probably an unrealistic way to feed a large herd because it would be, be quite expensive to mix up a ration that had sunflowers and peas and everything in it, molasses, that mineral, but that's the way these guys get fed. They, uh, they live a pretty good life. And uh, for me, because I'm not a cattle producer, never have been, I don't know how to assess visually if a cow is in good shape or not, but uh, definitely the one thing I can say over the last five, three years, I think, three or four years, we've, we've got steers. Um, I'm noticing, I'm noticing differences from year to year and differences from, you know, month to month as, the, as they grow. So the whole livestock feeding world is fascinating to me. He said, I was never, I never exposed to it. I was a town kid and just a, from a grain farming family. So these last basically 10 years of making feed and five years of having various critters around, chickens and pigs and, and cows. There's, there's been a lot to learn. And as we move uh, further up the old livestock yard here, we encounter our turkeys. So we had, uh, Got these from a, a, a neighbor lady that was hatching out turkeys. Of course, we know turkeys are hard to grow from uh, people who have tried to raise them. There's generally fairly high mortality. Um, so we only started with 10. And there, I believe there's still 10 in there. <laughs> this little chicken tractor thing, Corey built this. She actually did a pretty good job. So she's got a little part for them to get their shade. A little part out here for eating the grass and it's actually light enough even though it doesn't look like it is you just slide it around by hand slide it onto fresh grass it was sitting over there moved it over here so i'll most likely give it a move here today yet and buddy was just getting some uh getting some grain for them so you're gonna dump it or you're gonna put the whole thing in there bud so he's gonna dump that out for them that's a uh, mix left over from the turkey starter that Corey had bought and what did she buy she bought turkey starter and chick starter and uh then we start to mix it with our own grain this uh <coughs> where 
No more chicks in here. This is where they started out their life, right, buddy? So this was uh, another repurposed granary. And then she hung that heat lamp in there. And we had a little area built for them. And then they had the water and the feed and everything. She had that little house over there for the cluck that uh, hatched out those chicks. And then the other chickens, they live in this coop. So of course my dad built this one. Another repurposed granary. They're both actually pretty much the same size. And the cool thing about them with very minor alterations, <clears throat> this is what's left over when we bought our overhead door for our shop. Apparently they send an extra panel just for, um, for protection of the other panels. And it worked out good. If you just cut it, then it's insulated. So it makes like an insulated door and it's kind of, uh, Kind of fancy anyways, so at least we think it is. So then they get a door and uh, in here is whatever. I never did measure it. Eight by, it's probably nine by, uh, it might even be a perfect square, nine by nine, something like that. Roof's insulated, walls are all insulated. She uses these buckets for nesting boxes. And then the kids come up, get their eggs every day or every day or every two days, whatever. I didn't show him in here, Kate. Corey decided to use this style system. Of course, with Pinterest and everything, you have so many options of chicken feeders. Uh, probably fairly wasteful, but if you are willing to just leave it, then the chickens will they'll peck and scratch on the ground as well. And then you come out. That's actually a screen door that my dad built a hundred years ago. It was on their house in town. You come over and you get. Uh, the little storage area, the rest of the granary. And they had leftover railing from the deck when we put it on the um, on the trailer. There's a fridge in here too, yep. So they had leftover, uh, leftover railing from when we put the deck up on the trailer. So they actually purposed it and put it up there. So there's a little loft up there. Put all the electric fencing stuff and everything up there and there's a this fridge had semi failed it, it does work but uh it was leaking water when it thawed out into the house so we took it and instead of throwing it away we put it up here so you can put stuff in there if you want you don't want squirrels and mice to get at it and then uh i think even out here they insulated at least up to up to the top there where the plywood is and then they did a pretty good job. They wired it up. And uh, so it's got, got lights. Whoops. Dad, come on. Okay, we're gonna go now. So yeah, that's the that's the chicken coop. It is a little bit uh, a little bit snug, but okay, we want both doors. There's a door. There's a door to get out here. There's actually a door off my parents' house. door to get out over here well there they, they finally heard us so there comes the rest of the uh the rest of the crew with cookie the llama in the lead that's our guard llama so we like to source out uh the most colorful of, of cows so we're not uh we're not your typical commercial cattle people. We don't look for anything but uh, aesthetics, really. We like we like it to look funny, look good. So we've had uh, we've had Galloways and we've had Jerseys and we've had Galvies and we've had Highlands and we've had other breeds that I don't even know what they are. Um, different crosses and things. We had in the past bought or not we we didn't go buy them but we had a, a guy that was a, a cattle buyer um he'd find us stuff at the market that he knew would fit for us right because we're not your typical livestock raising individuals we're not looking for big simmental big angus and stuff like that so what he would do is if he found something that was looking a little off the wrong color shorter tail frozen ear whatever and it was a good deal 
he would pick it up because he was there anyways and then he'd drop it off here. So financially that was making sense, right? We had somebody that was willing to do that for us. And then bang, one year we had three, three delivered from him, four. Four delivered and three were from the same place. One was from a different place. And actually two out of the three that came from the same home, they died within like a week of being here. And uh, that was my first lesson in cattle production. So I did look inside of them and I found out that their stomachs were all full of plastic wrap and stuff like that. And then we went down that journey of finding out how many people take the twine off or the silage wrap off and stuff like that before they shred the bale. Um, and how many people are that ca con conscious, uh, cautious, whatever, about the um, conscientious, whatever, about the, the plastic being around their yard. Um, and it's kind of, it was actually a little bit alarming to me. There's a ton of people that just, they just fire the bales into the shredders or whatever, they don't take the time off. Um, there's lots of people that use silage wrap and bale wrap and stuff that <laughs> Nothing really against them. It's just it's hard to manage, right? It's blowing around your yard and it's everywhere and then these curious cattle get into it and then they eat it and then They get a plugged up stomach and effectively starve to death while they're eating. So That was a lesson that cost us Just under two grand, right? I think we were like nine hundred dollars an animal so that year, that was last year, that year we raised up 10 animals knowing full well that we were going to make no money because we had already lost $1,800 in those two. So that's just, uh, that's just the name of the game though. There's no one to, uh, you know, there's really no one to blame for that because it's, things happen, but it is frustrating. I think that everybody should experience that. Um, now by everybody, I don't mean cattle producers because they've already experienced it and I don't wish bad things on people, but, uh, for, for, uh, consumers, I think that consumers need to maybe not like experience it as in having animals die, but, uh, they should know about it. These boys don't take everything to the bank. <clears throat> well, dad arrived and he brought me a new hose. So these are original hoses. When they put the boom back together, they didn't uh, they didn't get her a hundred percent, and it's kind of rightfully so because it was never going to go to work again. Uh, and yesterday, when I was I had that uh, rock bucket on there, and I was just kind of digging through the dirt, getting the stumps out. And when I went to tilt down with this, I actually crushed this fitting right here. So that hose runs all the way to the back so it goes up this arm all the way down the top inside and then all the way up the bottom to here and the other side hose is going to here so anyways dad got we got that off dad ran it to town yesterday got a new end put on it and we put it back in and the crazy thing was when we went to try everything again we noticed that uh that this hose had blown uh somewhere Right around here, it was rubbing too much. So, it's really not that tricky of a thing to do if you're, uh, you know, if you've been down this road before. So, no different really than elevator chains or anything that has to go up and down inside of something. Tie a rope onto that end, pull it back through. Tie a rope onto the bottom end, pull it back through. Then you got your ropes there. Tie your ropes back onto the new hose and feed them through. If you forget the ropes, yeah, then you got a nightmare. Then you got a nightmare. I don't even know what you do. You'd have to try to find a long wire to run down there and then feed the rope through. So all in all, we were down basically half a pail of oil, which you can see that marks all the way over there and, and there, which is pretty much, you know, pound for pound, the biggest cost. I don't know what that length of hose is. I expect it's over $300. And then the fittings, they're expensive. They're about 40, 50 bucks a piece. So it could be, could be closer to five, maybe over five. But the oil, just that little bit of oil would have probably been, uh, I don't know, let's say 80 bucks or something. Because it was a little over half a pail. I think a pail is about 100 and, I don't know, 130 or 140 if you don't get it on sale. 
so the breakdowns are costing more and more and more. And uh, we were originally going to just cut the cut the hose in half, where or not in half, I guess, cut out the chunk that was broken. But when we got looking at the hose through so many ins and outs and so much rubbing and due to the fact it was original hose in this machine, I'm assuming, or certainly original to when we bought it, uh, it was just getting sort of fatigued and. If you cut it, cut out the, the bad part because there is about a foot extra and put new fittings on. You're already double the fittings because you need them for both ends. And uh, it's one of those mind over matter things where you get into a situation of, you know, a nickel holding up a dollar. So you're, you're trying to you're trying to be cheap and efficient and save money. And in the long run, it costs you double. So we just got the new holes and holes are good. Made a few alterations. We designed this hose holder here, right here. Um, probably going to patent that. It's, uh, there's some engineering went into it. You had to actually remove half of one piece and then, and then link them together. It's very technical. So that'll hold that up out of the way. Hopefully I won't pinch that again. For now, I'm going to hop over, make some bags of feet, test it out, make sure it works. And then uh, I don't know what the rest of the day is going to bring.